Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fairfield County Scores live webinar on 2021 tax recap and planning for 2022. I'm Bud Freund, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County, and I'll be your host. Our speaker today is Brian Pennington, and I'll have more on Brian in just a minute. First, a few in pieces of information about SCORE. We have about 240 chapters nationwide, and we have about 11,000 volunteers. We're part of the Small Business Administration, and here in Fairfield County, we have about 100 volunteers with a wide range of industry, process, and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary value added services to small business owners. Next slide, please. First, we offer free one-on-one -on -one counseling, face-to-face, -face, not so often right now, phone, mail, video, and email, which can be accessed via the request a mentor link on our website or via the link on the screen. Note, we currently are not doing face-to-face -face mentoring until further notice. We do educational workshops and webinars and about 150 of those per year. And finally, we have extensive resources on our website, including a network of subject matter experts at your disposal. We have converted some of our in-person workshops to live webinars due to the national health crisis. So look for specifics at fairfieldcounty.score.org. Here's some useful information about today's event. If you have a question, please use the Q&A window at any time during the presentation. It is located in the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end at 1 p.m. to respect your time, and the session is being recorded, and the link to the recording will be available at fairfieldcounty.score.org within a couple of days. Now about our speaker. Brian Pennington is a Director of Audit and Accounting at Venman and Company, LLC. Mr. Pennington has over 13 years of experience in public accounting and specializes in providing financial statement and tax services to privately held businesses and nonprofit organizations. What pages are stuck? There we go. He is a licensed certified public accountant in Connecticut and California and is a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. He received his BS in accountancy from San Diego State University. And I'll now turn it over to Brian. It's all yours. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Um, what we're going to be doing today is just kind of going over some of the kind of the basic changes from 2020 to 2021, just so everyone kind of knows what to look for on their 2021 tax returns as they're getting them um, going. And Kind of look into 2022 just for your kind of i assume most most people here are business owners um so just kind of for planning purposes and just so you, you're aware of the information that's out there um we're kind of going to keep it to a more basic level we're not going to go into the 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 deep um deep into the tax code um i don't want to lose anybody here but um yeah so we're going to kind of basically keep it fairly simple if there are questions like like, like Bud said, feel free to type them into the into the Q and A box. I'll kind of answer them as I'm going through. Um, if something pops out that I think would be um, would be would, it's great. It's it's always better to I think address in real time. So we'll, we'll go ahead and proceed with the presentation. And obviously, everything here is is more just kind of general knowledge. Things might be different um, on a case by case basis to make sure you don't kind of just don't take take what I'm saying and run with it um, because certain conditions or things might apply to your particular situation that 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 isn't kind of in general that might be more specific right, and granular. Um, 
So where do we stand now? So obviously the we have a, a new president um, and they were, had kind of their own kind of idea of okay, what, what kind of tax overhaul they wanted to do. Um, and they had this B Build Back Better Act um, that was proposed and on the table back in, I think, November, October of 2021. That has not really gone anywhere since then. Um, it sounds like it is unlikely to pass. Um, so I think right now what, what, what we are left with, with is not a whole lot of changes from 2020 to 2021 in terms of, okay, what can you expect on your tax return this year? Um, obviously you have kind of your standard annual increases that happen every year, um, but more or less, not really a lot of big changes that we need to really be worried about. Um, but let's go ahead and go through what did change. Um, so for those that have, um, you know, we have a question, I'll go ahead and answer it kind of before I jump in. Uh, pricing, I'm the only owner and only employee. What is a reasonable fee for my, for a CPA for my business? Um, so that's kind of a, a tough question because it, it always depends like for, I think I, I get, calls all the time, what, what the, how much does it cost for my tax return? It really depends. Um, it's how much bookkeeping assistance you need. Um, obviously, the more the cleaner your books are, the less time your tax preparer needs to spend on your tax return, the cheaper the cost will be. Um, and, to keep, and, for, and the pricing varies depending on the kind of the size of the CPA firm you're working with. We're kind of a 20 person firm, so we're going to be more expensive than a sole practitioner, but we're going to be cheaper than the kind of the bigger firms out there. So that kind of, it, it, it really ranges. Um, but it, it's hard to give you a good number uh, or even just a ballpark number because it could range wildly um, depending on how much bookkeeping services are needed. Um, so obviously just, I guess, for advice for keeping your costs down, obviously, it's to have your books as clean as possible before you give your records to a tax preparer. That way they're not spending time piecing things together. The cleaner your, your documents are, the, the, the less time it takes for the tax preparer to do your return, the cheaper the fee will be for, for that they'll charge you generally. Um, so I guess that helps. Hopefully that's a helpful. Um, Piece of advice is there a, and then there's another question is there a calculator available to estimate your federal taxes due there probably is i not the one that i use not one that i use so i, I don't have a good um good reference for you uh, maybe score score might have something that some sort of um reference there that maybe that they could um type in the box for you um but to go ahead and jump into the presentation here what what changed for 2021 so one of the kind of the main Big things that changed was the child tax credit. Um, I think one of the what the the, set, the president was trying to do was get get more money into the hands of families. Um, so this was a, a way to do that. He he increased the child tax credit from two thousand dollars to three thousand dollars in twenty twenty one, and they actually started mailing payments on the credit in advance starting in July. Um, if you so if you're a you're a family and you have a couple of kids that are meet the requirements of the child tax credit and you were eligible for it in the previous year, you probably started getting a check for it in July of 2021, um, unless you opted out of it. So how does that affect your 2021 tax return? Um, essentially what happens is what they're doing is they're mailing the credit out in advance. So then now you're not gonna get that credit on your tax return anymore because basically what they did was they sent them you the money in July instead of you getting that credit on your tax return. Um, so, yeah, and, and there's an increase in the credit. So, um, so keep an eye on that. If you happen to start getting payments on the tax credit, make sure you answer that on your return that you received it so that you're not kind of double dipping because then the IRS is going to flag it and then you're going to have to end up paying, paying it back in the future with penalties and interest. So make sure you keep an eye on that. And also the, keep in mind the for the child tax credit, it was previously phased out over $400,000. MAGI stands for Modified Adjusted Gross Income. Um, and so it's a, it's a line item on your tax return. So that's what the phase out threshold based on. That was lowered all the way down to $150,000 where it starts getting phased out. Um, so just keep that in mind for your return. So yeah, that's everything on the child tax credit. 
And kind of in the same family here is the child and dependent care tax credit. This is a credit that um, families receive for qualified expenses such as daycare or schooling um, for their children that, that meet the requirements. Uh, previously, that credit calculated at probably a max of about $1,000 um, for, uh, for, for one child. In 2021, that the, they changed the formula on it to really increase that credit up to $4,000 potentially. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of variables that go into how the credit's calculated um, and, and phase out limits that, that get factored in. But that generally, you, you can see that the credit increased quite a bit for this particular um, um, credit. And cash contributions, another piece that changed a little bit. In, in 2020, um, a lot of folks, well, even going back to the, to the, the tax job, the, the tax act that um, President Trump issued in 2018, it changed how a lot of people were filing their taxes. So a lot more people became standard, deduct, standard deduction filers instead of itemizing with, um, for, for all your state and local income tax is that that became capped um so all those cash contributions the contributions that people used to take as itemized deductions basically went away so in 2020 um they changed the code to allow up to 300 dollars in cash contributions um in addition to those for those people that were standard deductions now um folks so in 2021, we still have that um, cash contributions that are allowed for standard deductors, but it was increased for, instead of just being $300 max for both single or married filing jointly, they increased it from $300 single, $600 um, for married filing jointly. So now if you're, if you're a couple and you, and you report on the same tax return, you can now take $300 for, for both people. And when in the past in 2020, it was just 300 total, regardless whether you're a single or married filing jointly. That's what the MFJ stands for there on the on the slide. And we can go to re retirement plan contributions. Um, with COVID, this was a big um, kind of F what way the government was trying to get money um, back out to the people to, to help people during kind of the pandemic. Um, in 2020, um, you were allowed to take uh, distributions from your retirement account um, that were penalty free. So previously, before the pandemic, um, if, if you wanted to take money from your retirement account, you'd be taxed at like a 10% penalty. So that penalty has gone away. You still get taxed on your retirement distributions at the, your, their normal rate. But in the past, instead of having an additional penalty um, for distributing from your retirement account, you know, they waived that um, in 2020. Um, in 2021, you were a lot of those um, distributions and um, waivers went away. Um, you, there are still some allowed um, qualified distributions that avoid the penalty, but in 2021, it, you were more or less, um, if, you, if you were taken from your retirement, you had to pay a penalty on it. And then going back to 2020, any of those penalty-free COVID-related distributions, you were allowed to spread that tax um, on those distributions over three years instead of being hit with it all at once. So say you take a $100,000 distribution from your retirement, you would be paying that tax basically $33,000 each year for 2020, 21, and 22, instead of paying the tax on the entire $100,000 in 2020 all at once. So that's something that's gonna be affecting tax returns from 2021 and 2022 if you took a distribution in 2020 and opted to be taxed in that way. Um, let's see, I think there's a question. Let me see what this says. I'm going back to kind of the book, good record keeping, what does it look like? I think the, the cleanest way to do it is um, QuickBooks is obviously the, the most, most used um, accounting software out there for small businesses um, just because it, it accumulates data in a um, very organized fashion and provides you reports um, that keep your make sure that there's there's always reconciliation between your cash account to what gets reported on your profit and loss and things roll forward correctly. So QuickBooks is, is, is the simplest way to, to kind of keep your records, I guess, so to speak. 
Um, and as long as you're putting expenses and, and revenues in the right accounts, then that, that's kind of what, what we look for on our end. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, going back to where I was in the presentation, I think that was everything on the retirement plan distributions. I'm gonna go ahead and move forward to, actually, you know what, I wanna go back. Um, so I don't think I covered um, one, one piece on here, the first bullet. Um, in 2020, they, um, for people that did not want to take distributions, the required minimum distribution that you're required to take every year if you're over a certain um, age, um, they suspended that. So in 2020, you, were, you weren't required to take those minimum distributions. In 2021, you are required to take those minimum distributions again. Um, so you should have kind of seen that in 2021 if, and followed that kind of a, Accordingly, I'm sure whoever you use for your retirement account has is aware of that and, and made sure you were following that appropriately. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide here. And it's about student loan debt relief. I think I did have another question here before I move on. How are required minimum distributions treated for purposes of an inherited IRA during 2021? Banks send tax statements for full amount. So how, RMDs tr are treated for inherited IRAs. I don't have the, I can't speak off the top of my head on it. Um, usually the, the distributions on inherited IRAs are handled, so to speak, at the, um, at the investment level. So I don't get involved in, okay, what you need to take this and that um, usually. So I don't want, I don't want to say, speak out of turn on that. Um, the, uh, that's something I could certainly look up for you after the presentation. So if you want to send me a, an email, um, feel free and I can answer that for you. I just don't have it off the top of my head. But going forward here with my presentation, student loan debt relief, that's another thing that changed. Um, and starting in 2021, so for the next four years, any student debt relief that is um, that, that occurs for an individual is not taxable income for that for that individual. In the past, if you get student um, loan debt relief, that that would be taxable income. So say you had $20,000 of student loan um, debt out there that got um, relieved for some reason, you would have to report $20,000 of taxable income and you would have to pay taxes on that, uh, possibly, possibly up to like $5,000 in taxes um, that you would have to pay on your tax return. So starting in 2021 through 25, you're getting a little bit of a, of a reprieve on that. And they have, I have seen instances where some, the government has started relieving some student debt. I know that was kind of a big hot button issue um, during the presidential election and a lot, with a lot of Democrats wanting to fully relieve a lot of student loan debt. So I know some has happened in the, in the recent, um, in the past year. Um, so if that has happened in 2021 for you, then that is not taxable in 2021. So that's like obviously good news for anyone that's in that situation. Uh, go ahead and go forward to the next slide here. Self-employed, which would be probably a lot of you. So this is something to keep, keep an eye on. In starting in 2021, business meals that were previously 50%. So historically, meals and entertainment have always been meals or 50% deductible. The rest are non-deductible and entertainment, any sort of entertainment expenses are non-deductible. Um, starting in 2021 and for 2022, business meals that are purchased from a restaurant are considered now 100% deductible for these for last year and in 2022. So this does not count for any meals that are purchased at a grocery store. For whatever reason, that is not included. But if, if it's purchased from a restaurant or any sort of kind of restaurant related um, entity, then you are allowed to take 100% meal deductions. So you need to kind of think about how you're recording your meal um, expenses in, in your records. It goes, goes, kind of goes back to the um, question about what does good record keeping look like. Right now, we have to ask our clients, okay, for all those meals that you put in your um, expense account, please, please break it out between, okay, what were purchased from a restaurant, what was not purchased from a restaurant, because then that, that's how you get, get the 100% um, deduction versus 50% deduction now in 2021. Another piece kind of to keep in mind for self-employed individuals is business losses. 
Um, there was no cap on business losses between 2018 and 2020. You could deduct as much as was within the IRS tax code. You could deduct a million dollar tax loss if you had it. Um, this is now capped again um, starting in 2021. So you're capped at either a $250,000 loss for single or $500,000 loss for married filing jointly. This goes back to the pre how it was previously prior to 2018, prior to kind of the President Trump's um, tax code changes that he, he, he put in place. So that has gone away, the unlimited business losses. And I think it's good to kind of recap what did not change in 2020, because I know there's a lot of proposed changes out there and people were kind of acting on the fact that they were expecting some changes to occur, but these changes have not happened so far. Um, there has been no change. Uh, actually, before I jump into that, someone asked, please define certain for business meals. And I think I, I just went over that. It was the the, bit, the certain for business meals are the, they have to be purchased from a restaurant or a restaurant related type of business. So that's kind of what needs to be for 100% deduction. Going back to kind of where I was, what remained unchanged from 2020? Um, the capital gains tax rate did not change. Uh, that remained like there, were, there was talk about um, increasing the capital gains tax rate, but that did not change. The qualified business income deduction, which was new as part of um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that President Trump put in place, that remains in place and, and, still, a, and still a deduction for, for business owners. There is still that $10,000 state and local tax deduction cap. Um, which obviously hurts all, a lot of us Connecticut residents and any near, nearby, all the, a lot of the New England states um, are, affected, are affected by this, Massachusetts, New York. Um, previously, we used to get, you know, whatever we paid in property taxes and our state and income tax, we used to be able to take that as a deduction on our personal return as an itemized deduction, but we are still limited to the $10,000 that, um, that we've been um, limited to these past few years. The estate and gift tax amounts are still in place. The, um, these were expanded um, pretty heavily I mean, and with, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And as of now, the, these amounts are still in place. Um, the step up in basis rules. This was a big, um, a, a big hot button issue for that, that was proposed under the bill under President Biden's plan was to eliminate the step up in basis rules, which allow, which is when someone inherits a property, for example, fr fr from a loved one that passes away, the, the way the rule is now, so say that the house originally pr was purchased for $100,000, it's gone up to $500,000 in value. You get a step up in the basis at the, at the date of death for that $500,000. And so when you sell that house, you're only taxed at whatever you sell above that amount. So if you sell it for six hundred thousand, you're only taxed at one hundred thousand dollars. What they were trying to do was get rid of that step up, so that if you sold that house for six hundred thousand dollars and it had an original basis of one hundred thousand dollars for for the original owners, then you would be taxed at five hundred thousand dollars. So that was a kind of a, obviously a big issue that raised a lot of eyebrows, and it does not look like it has it, it has passed. And but it's always good to keep an eye. Um, on what might happen in the future. Um, you could just know that that was being quoted out there so that you never know what will happen in 2022. And there was no change in the C-Corp tax rates. And that was another kind of a hot button issue where um, they were trying to push through the new um, build, back, build, better, build Back Better Act, um, but that did not get passed. So the C-Corp tax rates remained the same as well. And this kind of goes al along the lines of what 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 was in the that um, the Build Back Better Act that President Biden was trying to push through in in the end of 2021. Um, these were some of the changes they were trying to add: additional tax for those that made um, adjusted gross income over 10 million dollars, and an additional tax up for that over 25 million dollars. Probably not a lot of people on the call right on the call right now, but that was one of the proposed new taxes, also proposed tax on new investment income tax on adjusted gross incomes over $400,000 or $500,000 for very filing jointly. And there was a proposal to increase the SALT deduction cap from $10,000 to $80,000. Uh, SALT again is the state and local tax deduction. There is the 
They also proposed a 15% minimum tax on large corporations that make over a billion dollars in profit. So like I said, again, none of these changes were passed, but just to keep, it's always good just to kind of keep in mind what changes they were trying to pass in case for when they do eventually get to getting some sort of tax legislation pushed through, what that just kind of have in the back of your head that what type of changes that they're trying to make. Um, other considerations for businesses, the PPP loan forgiveness, it continues to be non-taxable income. So if you had any um, PPP loan forgiveness that went through in 2021, you do not need to report that as taxable income. It's, a, it's considered tax exempt income on your tax return. And you are still allowed to take the deduction for the expenses that, 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 um, that you paid using the, that money. So it's kind of, you're able to double dip there a little bit by having non-taxable revenue and allowing to take the deduction um, for the expenses that you paid with those funds. The employee retention credit was new for a lot of businesses in 2021. This is treated as a reduction of your payroll tax expense. And just for those who don't aren't aware, the employee retention credit was a big, um, a big help for I think a lot of small businesses because what it basically did was allowed you to take a credit for um, salaries that you paid to employees um, over the course of different um, quarters if you met certain kind of requirements, one being either impacted by um, government shutdowns or um, having a decrease in revenues from, from year to year. Um, I'm not going to jump into kind of, I'm not going to jump down that rabbit hole, but just keep in mind if you, the employee retention credit was a big um, um, piece of revenue that was out there for small businesses and, and it's still out there for, for businesses and you, you, you can still go back to 2021 and amend your payroll tax filings to take this credit. So if that's something that um, you haven't looked into yet, I, I, I encourage you to do. Um, and that is also, like I said, non-taxable revenue if you did receive it, but it is treated as a reduction of your payroll tax expense because it's, it's filed through your payroll tax filing. So it's basically how, how they treat it is they reduce your payroll tax um, liability. Um, so some other kind of considerations for 2021, um, partner capital account basis are, basis are required to be reported to the IRS on a tax basis now probably a little bit too um, granular for, for what you need to be keeping in mind, but this is more kind of a, on the tax preparer side. Just keep in mind that tax preparers do need to report um, your basis activity a little bit more and make sure it's all reconciled and tied out. Um, so just keep that in mind for yourself. Another big kind of hot button issue right now is the, the effect of remote workers on state taxes um, for both the employer and the employee whether it's related to income tax, payroll tax, and sales tax. So before the pandemic, most people were going into the, into the office. Um, so some people would live in Connecticut, go, go work in um, New York, at an office in New York. So you would be paying income tax and payroll tax in, in, um, in the state of New York, because that's where you were working. And the, when the pandemic started in 2020, a lot of people were obviously working remotely. So they, they kind of did a little bit of a, um, a pass on, on trying to reach for, for the people working remotely now in Connecticut instead of New York, there's kind of the shared, okay, it's gonna just kind of we'll just continue to do it how we did it previously. But now a lot of those kind of reciprocity agreements between the states are going away because the remote working is starting to become permanent. So it, the state of Connecticut is saying, okay, now if you're working remotely in 2021 in Connecticut, they want you to pay your income tax in Connecticut. Um, they don't want you paying it to New York because if you're, they're saying if, if you're in Connecticut and now and 100 percent you're not going into the state of New York, there's no reason you should be paying income tax to the state of New York. You should be paying it to the state of Connecticut. So it's opened up kind of a, a bag, of, a, a can of worms for, especially here in New England, where a lot of the states are closely close together, where people can kind of travel between states and work remotely. A lot of people are buying houses up in Vermont and going to working remotely up in Vermont when they're even though their business is still located in Connecticut. So, how does that affect your tax liability in Vermont potentially? Um, so it's just something to keep an eye on and make sure you're you're aware that of where you're working matters um, for for your tax liability um, for for state purposes. And then you get into the whole sales tax issue. Um, that's been a 
a, a lot of changes there. Um, I think everyone's heard of the Wayfair tax ruling that happened um, last year where Wayfair is now required to pay sales tax for online sales um, to all these different states that they ship goods to. And obviously then that opens the opens it up to everyone else that has online sales nationwide. You really need to be paying close attention to what your sales tax um, or, um, liabilities are. Um, liabilities are for the for your different states that you you're, you're shipping goods to. Um, someone asked, what if your time is split between working, I assume you mean working remotely here in Connecticut versus working in an office, maybe in New York. You generally need to start calculating that if you're spending half your time in Connecticut, half your time in New York, the general tax law says, okay, you should be paying income tax on in both states, half, half, of your, half of your income tax in Connecticut, half of your income tax in New York. And then it becomes on you to be able to prove your where you are all the time because each state's going to want to want to say, okay, you should prove to me that you were only working here half the time, and you need to be able to show both states that. Um, so both states are going to want be wanting to see how you're coming up with that split. Um, so it, it makes it things a lot more complicated, um, obviously. I think that was everything I wanted to cover there. Let's see what else did I have. So those for here in the state of Connecticut, um, no, like I said, no big changes in 2020. The, the pass-through entity tax is still in place for those that um, have LLCs and S-Corps. So if you have an LLC and S-Corp, you are required to pay a, this tax to the state for, any, for eligible revenues. And then you get a credit back on your personal return for that, for that tax that you paid during the year. So that is still in place in 2021. So you just make sure you're aware of that. Yeah. More or less the same, same deal as previous years, the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Another thing to keep an eye on is Connecticut um, has different depreciation rules than, than the IRS. Um, so on, the fed, on your federal return, if you, were, if you took what's called section 179 or bonus depreciation for, for any big purchases that you made on machinery or furniture during the year, you're allowed 100% deduction for depreciation on your federal return. However, in Connecticut, you are not allowed that 100% deduction. That, that cost is basically spread over five years um, instead of one instead of 100% deduction in, in the year you, you got that asset. So in 2021, you buy a $10,000 asset that you only get $2,000 of depreciation in Connecticut. When you on the federal return, you get $10,000. So and that gets spread over five years. So it's makes a little bit of a reconciliation issue that you need to kind of track off your books um, and create a schedule. Let's see, any questions? I think that was kind of the, the, the bulk of what I wanted to go over today. I wasn't planning on spending the full hour. Um, I want, so I wanted to be sure I'm spending time on um, questions. So are there any, any questions out there that I could, um, I could address any that, I have, that haven't already been addressed during, during the presentation? Brian, I've got one as, um, sure. as a small business owner. Um, the estimated quarterlies, uh, er everybody I've talked to, they always come up as a surprise. You know that they're coming. You know you've got to save for them. Do you have any suggestions or strategies for maybe opening a, a separate savings or, or checking account at your bank so it's kind of out of sight, out of mind? Or, or some other strategies so that as those taxes come up every quarter, you don't feel like you're getting surprised and caught. Absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah, setting up a separate account is definitely a, a good way to do it. Um, and obviously you should be, the, the main, the, I guess the, the fir first place to start is you should obviously be having separate bank accounts for your business and your personal return. So I think that, that's usually kind of the step one. Of, of that answer so make it because you, you definitely don't want to be commingling activities from your business into your personal um, so that's kind of the first step is making sure you have a separate business account and obviously is coming up with a plan to always make sure you you're you have a, a good cushion um, in your checking account and savings so it kind of just goes back to best um, accounting and financing of your business is making sure you're not you're not um, living and dying on your business with, with 
with five thousand dollars in your cash account you really want to make sure you're building up a good cash reserve from your business activities to maintain those expenses over the course of the year and as a business owner you should be aware of what expenses that you have every year um, and kind of come up with a budget um, i mean that's really what you need to be doing is having a budget of what, what kind of expenses you have on an annual basis so that you could make sure you have the cash in your bank to to meet those requirements um, in, in going forward. So that's kind of the best way to, best advice I could give for, for business owners is really to, it's not, it goes outside of just having, being prepared for your quarterly estimated tax returns. It's all the other expenses that businesses have, whether it's um, your insurance premiums or what other kind of one-off expenses that maybe come up once a year or twice a year, um, just making sure you kind of plan for that budget for it, so to speak. I think we had a couple of questions that came into the box here. Can you reiterate our responsibilities for taxes for online sales? I am in Connecticut, but haven't had any orders within the state. So obviously you, the state tax requirements for online sales is a big, big thing that are changing just now, kind of in real time, um, especially, and it's gonna be a big issue for small businesses like yours um, that need to track you, you need to be tracking your sales by the state. So I know there's a lot of products out there um, like Shopify, for example, where you, that, that'll break down all your sales by state. And you should be taking, looking at that and determining if you are required to pay sales tax in each state. And yes, it goes then to looking at every single state's um, sales tax requirements and determining if you need, you're required to pay sales tax in each state that you're shipping goods to. So every state has different thresholds and, and it, it, it goes outside of what even, I know off the top of my head, obviously, um, every different state's um, sales tax requirement. So it starts with having your sales, tracking your sales by state and by country. And then usually there's a lot of good products out there for um, online retailers that will track your sales. And then you also, they all should be, should have a, Kind of a, a piece that tracks the sales tax component to it as well so that you're hopefully taking sales tax and collecting sales tax on those goods that you're shipping out okay the next question here was am i understanding the charitable contribution correctly if we take a standard deduction we could take up to 600 dollars additional deduction for charitable giving for married filing jointly that is correct yes so if you be, it has to be a cash contribution it's not the non-cash you can't do the non-cash contributions but if you make a cash contribution to a 501c3 charity nonprofit organization yes you could take 600 dollars additional deduction on your personal return yes that is correct okay let's see another last question i see here is there a good source or summary of annual legal deductions there are so many would be nice to know as you're business longevity increases or business needs evolve, what other new deductions can one take? Um, for the most part, most expenses that you incur um, are deductible if, if it's related to your business. Um, there are obviously some that aren't deductible like entertainment expenses, um, but for the most part, most expenses if you're incurring should be deductible. And obviously if you have like, um, if you're having health insurance that you're paying out of, out of your out of your um, business then that's a different type of deduction um it's, it's not really allowed for your business but you're allowed to take kind of some sort of deduction on your personal so for the most part um most business expenses are deductible um keep in mind i guess if you're kind of in a growth mode um any kind of big big purchases that you make like for machines or furniture or um, certain improvements to your buildings, you are allowed to take 100% deduction on those expenses in year one on the IRS. But like I said, in the state, then you had to, you, you have to, for using the bonus in section 179 deduction. But like I said, again, previously with the state, you have to, for the state, you're only allowed to take it over five years. Hopefully that answers that question. I'm not sure if there's anything else I could, um, I, I could, advice I could give there. Uh, let's see, does your practice give discounts to new business owners, mother, led businesses. We don't personally, I guess, ha have any sort of paid set deduction. Um, I think we, what we do at our firm is we kind of take it on a client by client basis. Um, it's really hard to give discounts, I guess, during tax season, especially because we're so busy that we don't, we're doing the best we can to kind of get 
keep keep um, keep the returns moving here in our office. Especially, I think what right now we're all businesses are in a, a staff shortage mode where um, everyone's looking for help. It's not just the accounting industry; all industries are looking for help. It seems like um, so that the labor shortage is a real kind of takes a takes a real big hit because we don't have the the additional staff to take on and 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 I'd love to kind of be able to give, I guess, discount, so to speak. Um, but it's, um, we don't really, I guess, ha have a set program for, for, um, for I guess, t discounts during tax season. I guess what we do for some people is we'll extend their tax return and then maybe do their tax return during non-busy times. And then that's a way we could kind of do, do, do a return for a little cheaper maybe. Um, but generally we don't give, I guess, discounts um, kind of for, for certain types of businesses. Um, let's see. There's a question here. Can you please explain qualified business deduction for professional consult consultants? So the, I, I believe this question is related to the qualified business income deduction um, that, that, that is allowed. Um, and gosh, I don't have the, the, the exact terminology of how that is calculated off the top of my head, but generally how the qualified business income deduction works is if you have a what's considered a qualified business and a professional consultant may not be one. Um, so you might not be um, you might not be allowed this deduction, but for certain qualified businesses, you pay a thousand dollar tax and you get some sort of deduction that's calculated on your on your personal return. That's generally how it works, it's, but it's kind of a case by case basis that you have to kind of, it's hard to give me give you a good example off the top top of my head. I know I went over this a couple of years ago when this all came out in 2018, 19. So I need to brush up on the specifics again. Um, but so I'd be, uh, if you have a question that I could kind of maybe ask, you could ask one off, I could always send me an email. I could always help you out on a kind of just on a personal um, case by case basis, so to speak. All right, so there's another question here with estimated taxes. What is the government's expectation Someone back filing for 2020, if only one source of income was pandemic unemployment assistance that year for 2020, I made four payments at the same level of 2019 income I earned, thinking the government would give me penalties if I didn't match it. So generally what your what the expectation is of the taxpayer is you either have to pay what your taxes up to, I think it's 110% of your taxes from the previous year, or if you don't have that, aren't expecting that same threshold of revenue, for the next year, you could pay based on what you think your taxes will be for 2020. Um, so if you're if you're going to be obviously well below your threshold in 2020 than you were in 2019, then you're only required to pay to the government what your taxes are expected to be. You're not obviously you don't need to go and pay what your full amount was in 2019. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. I'm not sure if I was clear on that or not. Uh, here's another question here. With an LLC being a pass-through entity, does it make a difference whether quarterly tax payments are made from business or personal bank accounts? Um, no, I guess you could do it from either one because obviously you're getting taxed from your person personally. So if you want to pay that from your business and call it a distribution, um, you could certainly do it that way. Um, so no, you could do it either way for, for those um, However, I would say if you're paying your Connecticut pass-through entity tax, I would make sure you're paying that one through your business because that is considered a business tax, not one from your personal um, account. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, let's see here. Then a couple of questions I noticed pop came in through the chat, not the Q and A. Um, is there a site that lists all the states and rates for online sales? I do not know off the top of my head. I'm sure there is one out there. If, I, if you um, Google, I, I would just Google it. Probably, and, um, I'm sure there's a site out there that lists all the different states and rates for online sales. I'm sure there is something out there. Okay, another question here. RM, the required minimum distribution was not taken in 2020. Are you required to retroactively take the 2020 with, amount with 2021? No, no. So, you, so the required minimum, require, required minimum distribution in 2020 was suspended so you do not have to take it but you're not you don't have to catch up on that distribution in 2021 so you're just required to take your again your standard requirement on distribution in 2021 
I think I got through all the questions there. Any any other ones that have come through? I think I got everything. Yeah, up. Brian, I've got another question sure. for you on the sure. Connecticut State uh, sales and use tax. Mm -hmm. I know some people pay it on a quarterly basis. I know other people who pay it on an annual basis. Right. What's the differentiator that determines whether you have to send them your check on a quarterly or you send them a check annually? It's just the level of activity. So it, it, the more active you are, the more sales you have, um, that, that's when you end up getting on the, on the quarterly payment system versus the annual. If you're not as active or don't have as many sales in the state, that you then you could do the annual. I don't know what the threshold is off the top of my head, but that's the general idea behind it. It's um, if if the more active you are, the more sales tax you're collecting and having to pay, then the state wants you to pay on a quarterly basis. So that, that is the, the main difference. Great. Thank you very much, Brian. Are there any other questions going once? I think I got one more that just came in here. Uh, can you file business and personal at the same time, or can I pay file my personal tax on Turbo and use my CPA for my business for my business to uh, avoid any penalties? Yeah, you could certainly. Um, obviously, you can't file your personal until your business tax return is done, because most likely you have an LLC or an S corp. So when you file your business return, then you're going to get a, get, a, get a, you're going to get a K one from that business that then you then have to report on your personal return. But do not do your personal return before your business um, because you have a K-1 that you need to report on your personal return. Um, but you could certainly do the personal return yourself on TurboTax and then have your CPA do the business. That's certainly a way to kind of save some money on your taxes. Um, just make sure that you're kind of putting the things in, the, the, the reporting things correctly on TurboTax. I know it's very easy for TurboTax to miss certain things. Um, so just kind of keep an eye on kind of some of the things we talked about um to make sure that turbo tax is reporting it correctly on your tax return um, as best as you can as best as you know let's see um enjoyed hearing every people's questions i think yeah i think everything was addressed so yeah thanks everyone for listening um hopefully feel like i said feel free to reach out anytime with questions um i'm here to help so if yeah i, I don't charge if, if you send me an email i'm not going to send you a bill for it so um Feel free to reach out with me. If you send me an email, me with questions, I try and help out businesses as much as I can, especially small businesses that are kind of growing because I just you know, would have my way of kind of giving back, I guess. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, feel free to reach out by my email or phone. Um, you know, I'm happy to help any way I can. Well, thank you very much, Brian. That, that's a very generous offer. And as a reminder, folks, uh, a recording of this webinar and the materials will be available within a couple of days on the fairfieldcounty.score.org website. Next slide, please, Brian, if you would. Please check our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org for information on upcoming webinars. And again, SCORE offers free individual counseling. So please use the link on the screen or visit our website and click request a mentor. We are available for sessions via phone, email, or video. Also, please fill out your evaluations that will be sent at the end of the webinar. And on behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's webinar. And in closing, a big thank you to Brian for presenting today and have a nice rest of your day, everyone. No problem, thank you, everyone.